None of us understood the extent of what we were dealing with. Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers. Holy moly, how could this be happening? Economists believe we are now in a recession. I saw this moving from Wall Street to Main Street. New York City fat cats expect Joe Sixpack to pay for all this nonsense. The public wanted to hear those that made the mistakes are going to be held accountable. And next month, they're going to come back and ask for more. What we did was not for these banks. It was to save Main Street from a catastrophe. It's important that there be a historical record so we don't replay this movie all over again. I'm Patrick Gavin Politico. I'm joined by Hank Paulson, former Treasury Secretary, and now you're kind of a movie star. Well, Are you calling yourself a movie star? Yeah, that's, the new movie's uh, called Hank, the yeah. documentary about the financial crisis and a little bit of kind of a, bi a biography on you. Right. And it's hit movie theaters everywhere. You're a star now. Well. A Hollywood star. You've always been <laughs> a bit of a star. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly am in the documentary and it features me. Yeah. You know, um, um, the, the thing I want to start off asking you, which I thought was really interesting, is you end the movie by saying um, this is not about looking back. This is not about, uh, you know, me being preoccupied with the past. You say what this movie is. Uh, is sort of providing a template for your predecessors to sort of know what happened. But it is a very, I mean, blow-by-blow blow account yeah. uh, of what happened during your time uh, at the Department of Treasury during the housing crisis, during uh, the failure of all these banks. Um, so for me, it was sort of, I want you to sort of explain how, uh, even though it's, you say it's not about the past, there does seem to be a lot of things that you wanted to kind of correct about what happened. Well, the, the, the objective behind making this, and, and let me step back a yeah. bit and say, when I was approached, I strongly resisted at first. I, I said no for a, a number of months, but what convinced me to go ahead and, and, and do this was, I, I think it's very important that we learn from mistakes that were made. As I say at the end, we don't want to have to replay this movie over again. I think it's very important that we get the lessons learned. And we made this, Bloomberg made this, on the five-year anniversary of the crisis. Right. And that really does give you a little bit more perspective. I was very happy, and I still am, with the book I wrote, which really documented what we found, why we made the decisions we made, and so on. But this, this, this film was an opportunity to get out in another media form and do it with more perspective five years after the fact. And was there any frustration on your behalf uh, of whatever current narratives accounts existed? In other words, were there wrongs, perhaps just in the media reporting of it, that you wanted to write? Well, there, 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 you're always going to have uh, misunderstandings and make no doubt about it. When I left uh, Treasury in January of 2009, the way I read the polls, uh, the rescue measures we used, the actions we took were less popular than torture yeah, in, right. in the polls. That are, right. So I, I looked at it and said the things we did worked. Uh, by and large, they were very successful. They prevented a, a major disaster, but they were very unpopular. And I expect them always to be unpopular. I don't expect the American people to like bailouts. Uh, a, a lot of the things we did, uh, we knew they'd be unpopular. They were objectionable to me and to Ben and, and to Tim, uh, but they were better than the alternative. And I look back and say, by and large, we, we got the big decisions we made right and they prevented economic disaster. But the purpose of the film, what the idea that Bloomberg came to me with was this is the five-year anniversary, so let's uh, let's talk about what you encountered during the crisis with a bit more perspective and what are the lessons learned. You know, the other thing that struck me about it was um, even though while it was happening, I think I mean you'd have to be living under a rock to not appreciate the magnitude of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I also got the sense that, or maybe just get your take on. Even now, do people appreciate how bad either it was or it could have been? Because you guys go into very, very specific detail with very scary music and yeah. you know, looming graphics. Uh, and, and, and I sort of watched that and I thought that 
maybe what you're trying to convey, what the filmmaker's trying to convey, is I don't know that you all appreciate just how bad this well, was. Well, let me step back even further and say, this was a very independent documentary. This was Bloomberg. Uh, the filmmaker, Joe Berlinger, right. had editorial control. I, I didn't have any editorial control. So it was a big step for me to agree. Were you okay with how it came out? Yeah, I was, I, I was okay with how it came out. And uh, I was uh, quite concerned during different steps in the process that, you know, because I sat down and there were eight or nine hours of interviews. Hmm. We did it over, you know, a, you know, five hours one day and, and three hours the next day. But you never know how that's going to come out in a film that's 80 minutes. And I, I don't know if there's, you know, I don't know, 40 minutes of me talking. And, uh, but, but I think one of the things he did was to take a very compl complicated set of facts and actions and to uh, simplify it without dumbing it down to the point that, right. that it really uh, reminds people of what we went through. And, um, and, and so to that extent, I think it's a, uh, it's, it's a valuable uh, contribution to history. Well, this being a newsroom filled of political junkies, there are a couple, I think, kind of axioms on politics that you talk about throughout the film. One of them is, is Congress. And at one point, you talk about how proud you were that you were able to work with Congress on some things. But then at other times, it's clear, either in news clips or in your own words, that there was a little bit of frustration at times. Right. Uh, when you look at both your time at Treasury and let's just look at things now, um, how would you sort of assess Congress's, obviously we're stereotyping here, uh, knowledge on financial issues. Would you like them to be more up to speed? Do you feel as if there's a gap in knowledge between our elected officials and sort of what's happening on Wall Street? Well, first of all, in terms of my perspective, in terms of what we went through, and this is where five years really made a difference. When I was going through the financial crisis, it was so blindingly obvious to me that we are on the precipice of disaster. I was really frustrated by what I thought was a long time it, it, for, for, it, it took for Congress to act. I look back at it now and I say, wow, twice we got uh, emergency powers, unprecedented emergency powers, first with Fannie and Freddie and then with the TARP, and there was bipartisan support. And I'm proud of the fact that I was able to work with Democrats and Republicans and we got this done. And so I look back at it now and I also look and say uh, there, there was a great policy continuity between administrations. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the programs were in place before I, I left. Most of the money had gone out the door before I left. Uh, but because Tim Geithner had played such a critical role in working with me and putting these programs in place and uh, President Obama picked him as his Treasury Secretary. I think Tim was ultimately able to convince the President to resist, you know, the natural tendencies for his base to want to throw out some of the programs and start over. And, you know, that we had great policy continuity. Uh, obviously, Ben Bernanke, I, I think, was just a terrific chairman of the Fed, and, and his continued leadership made a big difference in all of that. So, I, I look at that quite positively. Now, it's got to be another side of the story. Yeah, well, no, no, I, I'm saying, but the other side, the, you know, and, 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 and it was a poisonous atmosphere even then. I mean, sure. 28, you know, the President Bush had 28 approval ratings, and, right. and, 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 and he was just a terrific uh, boss all the way through this. But so today, I, I just look at it, I just look at how poisonous the atmosphere is, and I wonder. If, if it had been as bad when I came in, would we have been able to do what we needed to do? Well, aside from sort of the, the, the bitterness, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, but, but to get to your biggest issue, which is economic issues, do people understand economic issues? Well, Congress specifically. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would start, first of all, with the American people. I think economic literacy is a huge issue. And so I think these are very complicated issues. They're very, very easy to demagogue. And you know it would have been quite easy for for either presidential candidate at the time, uh, Barack Obama or John McCain, to demagogue that. And if they had, we never would have got the authorities we need because there was a giant 
collision between politics and and economics and markets uh, because a crisis occurred just before a big national election. So today, uh, you know, I, I don't think congressional leaders, I think some congressional leaders are quite knowledgeable in these issues. Was that to say uh, not? Uh, yeah, yeah, m many of them are not uh, as knowledgeable as you would like them to be. And even some of the ones that are quite knowledgeable uh, uh, shy away from voting for something that's going to be very unpopular. Right. And when they voted for the TARP, I, I think any leader that had their head screwed on right, whether they were a Democrat or a Republican, knew that they were making a very unpopular vote. And I was quite encouraged they did it for the good of the, for, for the, good of the country. But well, Titch, I mean, you, you say at the end of the film that you get asked a lot, will we have another crisis again? Right. You always say, well, of course we will. You'll always have another crisis when you have the kind of system that we have with markets. And you, and you say, but what's important is to have a political system that can address these things. And you, and you just said, yeah. you kind of alluded to how difficult having today's political climate back then might have been. And I wonder, do you have confidence in, I mean, were a crisis to happen on your way out the door today? Is the political climate, is the political system we have in place now you think sufficient enough to handle that crisis, well, or are you more pessimistic about well, 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 it? Done well, here's, things? first of all, there's, there's a number of aspects to this. First of all, we are certain to have financial crises in the future. As long as you've got right. markets, you're going you're gonna to have financial crises, number one. So the key is to address them before the, you know, the, the excesses are so great uh, and, a, and a huge bubble burst, and they have the authorities to deal with it. Okay, so now let's get to the authorities. If we had had the emergency authorities we needed, we'd had the right regulatory system with the right powers, and the powers to dealing with deal with failing financial institutions that aren't banks, you know, the Lehman Brothers of the world, uh, we might not have had to go to Congress. So. The, the key question is, do you have the authorities? And because one of the things I've learned in working with Congress is it's very, very difficult to get Congress to act on anything that's big and controversial and difficult unless there's a crisis. And even long term. Right? You know, oh, right, it's it's crisis. clearly long term. Right. So, so unless, there's, unless there's an immediate crisis, it's, it, it's very difficult to to, to how do you get, break out of that long, long, long jam? I mean, I think you're actually even looking at a climate crisis now. I mean, how do you get this Congress, this town, to act on something that may not happen for 5, 10, 15, 20 years? I think that's a challenge, and I really want to be optimistic because I continue to believe our system is the best system there is in the world. I, I think are it, you optimistic? I, I, well, <laughs> we all I, want to be. Well, I, I, I would simply say this. I think it's going to take really strong leadership and I, I think uh, you know a, occasionally a, a really strong leader emerges I think it's going to take uh, it takes extraordinary leadership from the chief executive officer and for the president because uh, remember uh, members of Congress are elected by their party and the president is the one with responsibility for re representing all of the um, all, all of the people so it's it, it's, it takes hard work uh, with, with Democrats and Republicans to get bipartisan uh, reform. I also think that uh, there, there are two structural issues that concern me like they concern many Americans. Uh, things that I call legalized corruption like uh, political gerrymandering, redrawing the right, right. congressional districts. And, and I think that really works against us in, in the House. And then the other thing that uh, works against us really uh, are structural issues around how we get news. It, you know, competition is a great thing. Yeah. You know, political does, it, 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 you do a great job and, it, and it's, but I, I would say that I'm concerned that as I look at my friends on the right, they're all talking to each other. They're getting their news from the same websites. They're dealing with the same set of facts. My friends on the left are dealing Everybody's with a different set of facts. Yeah. And so there's so much, uh, so much divisiveness in terms of the American public. And I think you've got to expect congressional leaders to reflect the voters that, that, that elect them. That's who they look to for their jobs. 
So I think those are difficult structural issues. But yes, I, I do believe the number one problem we have in this country are, are not economic issues, they're political issues. Yeah. I'm firmly convinced that if every member of, of, of Congress was term limited, they would be able to get together and work across the aisle and come up with the kinds of, uh, of bipartisan solutions you need. And to me, the big economic issues can be solved by government only when you have true bipartisan reform, whether it's immigration reform, whether it's tax reform, whether it's uh, entitlement reform. Uh, these are fundamental issues, and our country desperately needs them. So are any of these issues uh, <coughs> things that you, I mean, in other yeah. words, what do you want to focus on next? I know that your friend and colleague, Ben Bernanke, just took a new job today yeah. at Brookings. Do you want to work together with him on stuff down the road with other folks? Uh, what's sort of <coughs> on your, on your to-do well, list? Well, I've been working really quite hard in uh, a number of areas. I have set up an, an not-for-profit institute, the Paulson Institute, which is headquartered at the University of Chicago. It's a think and do tank. It's got four or five people in Washington. It's got five people in Beijing. And it's focused on US-China relations with a big emphasis on sustainability and environmental issues and cross-investment issues, economic issues between our two countries. And so we have a number of, of, of active pilot programs. I travel regularly to China. I'm just completing a book on China. I've also set up with the Nature Conservancy as staff a Latin American Conservation Council uh, focused on big conservation issues in Latin America. I have eight or nine U.S. CEOs on that board and about 30 Latin American CEOs and a number of government leaders and again, big conservation issues. So I'm very, very so I'm very <laughs> engaged, I'm quite, it's not that I don't care. I care about the issues in Washington, but as I think about my time in terms of, there are a lot of people that know much more than I do about the political system here and can make the same kinds of points that I would make. And I think I have a comparative advantage on working on some of these other uh, issues and particularly U.S.-China relations. Would you like to work with Mr. Bernanke more on some of that stuff you just mentioned? Well, I, I would say I look forward. I, I very much enjoyed working with Ben in, in, in government. I mean, he's an amazing guy. And I think one of the big stories of the financial crisis was the extraordinary level of trust and cooperation and coordination between Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and me. And it was, it was really very valuable that, um, that although we may have debated tactics, we were always in 100% agreement that the worst mistake we could make was inaction. We needed to do anything that we, we could to prevent systemically important institutions from failing. We needed to work to stabilize the markets and keep credit flowing. Uh, ben uh, worked with me and, on the strategic economic dialogue with China. And so, you know, I would obviously welcome any, any views he had or an opportunity to work with him on China. But I would imagine also uh, he will want to do what I did the first year out and uh, decompress get and uh, get some sleep. And because uh, he's pretty amazing, you know, he's, he's, he's been here for, for 10 years. Yeah. He worked with four different Treasury secretaries. Right. Well, last we got to let you go. Uh, what is your take on his uh, successor, Janet Yellen, at the Fed? Do you, do you uh, support her being there? Do you, oh, do you admire her? Uh, of course, her I years? support her being there. I admire her. I, I obviously don't know her well like I know Ben, but she sat by his side as we went through the, the financial crisis. She's, she's a top-notch economist. She's had great government experience. And she's, you know, you couldn't ask for someone to be better prepared to uh, take on, take on that job. All right, Hank Paulson, are you going to be uh, an, an Academy-nominated documentary subject? Uh, You're a movie star now. Yeah. First, I need to grow some hair. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for joining. Okay. Us. Okay. I appreciate it.